Hey there, hi there, hello there. Good morning. This is Don Zoldai. I am your host for the Drones at Dawn podcast. Thank you, Inner Drone, for having us. And we are knee deep in the month of May, and we are focused on global drone regulations. Today, we are going to talk about European drone regulations, and no better person to speak about this than our special guest, Yves Morier. He was formerly with EASA. He was with the French Civil Aviation Authority. And so welcome, Eve, to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm uh, honored to be here. Yeah, we are so honored to have you. For those that have been following drone regulations, especially in Europe, uh, Eve is a legend. And to have him on this podcast is an absolute uh, privilege. And it's, it's my pleasure to interview you today. Um, for all of our guests out there, please remember this is live, so go ahead and drop your questions in the chat for Eve. Uh, give us some positive encouragement. Let us know where you're dialing in from. We love to give shout outs to our, our, our uh, special uh, folks that are out there watching us. So without further ado, let's jump into this, Eve, and let's just start with a little bit about you. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, thank, thank you. My, so my, my background, I, I train as an uh, aircraft uh, aer aerospace engineer in the French Civil Aviation Academy. Worked for the French Civil Aviation Authority for a, for a couple of years until 91. Then moved to what could be seen as a predecessor of IASA, the Joint Aviation Authorities, until 2004. And then went to ESA in 2004 until I retired 2019. Uh, I did various things in ESA, but my last five years were basically dedicated to dedicated to working on new technologies, drones, and advanced air mobility. So, if you did the math, then you figured out what what happened in in this industry. Eve was on the forefront of creating the regulations that exist now in Europe, and so thank you so much again for being here. Let's let's. Um, I don't know that people in the United States or maybe even in other countries fully appreciate the how EASA works basically. So you have the European Union, you have this overarching policy, and then you have the member states. Can you explain to us, Eve, the role of EASA and vis-a-vis -vis the member states, what each of them is responsible for doing? Okay, so EASA is uh, responsible to give the approvals in relation with design, type certificates, uh, appro approval of design organization. EASA is also responsible to give the approvals for foreign organizations, for example, production or maintenance organization outside the member state of ESA. Uh, ESA is also responsible for providing the, the European Commission with regulatory proposals. The member states are responsible for, I would say, all the approvals, pilot license, um, uh, maintenance organization that are located in their in their country. So the, the, the vast majority, in fact, of approvals is is given by by the member state. As the member state are playing a key role into implementing the various EU regulation, uh, ESA organized a process that we call standard monitoring of member state or standardization, by, by which we see how member state apply the rules, and uh, we produce findings on which the Commission acts upon. So it's a it's tool to maintain a high level of uh, uniformity in Europe. Okay, so, you know, I should have done this from the beginning because I'm former military and I'm very sensitive to acronyms. For those that don't know what EASA actually stands for, it's the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. And as Eve just informed us, basically EASA provides that high level policy uh, regulations that go to the European Commission. And then the member states, which uh, include, I believe, Eve, what, 27 member states plus, is it Luxembourg? 
uh, Iceland, Norway, I'm sorry, Iceland, Norway, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein plus the 27, they're all the member states, is that right? That's perfectly correct. We, as you know, we lost one recently. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, so that's that's the the bifurcation, and you know, for United States listeners, it's really interesting because we're going through this. Uh, I'll call it churn right now as to what the FAA, what their authority and, and responsibility should be. Although you think we know that by now, and what role the actual individual states in the United States should play vis-a-vis -vis drones, uh, whether it's you know. Uh, air corridors for drone commercial drone use and things like this. So very interesting, the level of almost autonomy, to use that word, that the member states have with EASA guidance, and as you said, oversight and monitoring. So it sounds like that's pretty squared away. So let's, let's do kind of a high level overview so people get familiarized. You know, a lot of people are familiar with part 107, which is our small UAS rule here in the United States. I understand that you uh, in Europe have different categories uh, that that um, uh, relate to operations, the open category, which is low risk. Let's talk about first this open category. And can you explain what size or level of drone we're talking about for that and what rules apply to those type of drones? Okay, so the size is below 25 kilos, so 55 pounds. Um, it's, there is no, necess no approval necessary to operate in the open category, uh, but there are a number of limitations, quite classical limitations, fly below 120 meter uh, height, uh, remain visual line of sight, uh, fly far from, from aerodrome, uh, that's probably the, the, the most uh, the most important one. So it's a, it's quite comparable to uh, part 107. The probably difference I would say would be in relation with the pilot training where we have been probably we rely, we require only online training in most of the case, but we have been more I would say stringent on the approval of the technical approval of the drones themselves. They have to comply to certain technical requirements. So we, we found perhaps a bit of a different balance that you have in the US between approval of the drones and the qualifications of the pilot. So again, just from what you said earlier, the approval of the actual drones or, or the, uh, the technical certification, as you just said, that is at the EASA level not the member state level? Uh, not, not in the case of the open category because the drones are not actually certified. They are approved like consumer uh, equipment. We have in Europe something called the CE marking, which is put on any consumer device. You can see it on the computers, for example. And this is in fact not a certification and this approval will be given by the member states. Only those that are certified on, of, in the sense of aviation aircraft certification are done by ESA. Okay, that makes sense. And so you're right, very similar to part 107. You, you said, you know, can't really fly over people. We just had a new rule that came out over that, uh, about that, the, our operations over people in at night rule. Uh, have to fly afar, afar from aerodromes or airports, which is our case as well. Uh, the difference is no pre-approval, which is interesting because, you know, we have our Lance system and other things. And, and as you said, also, we really focus on uh, making sure the remote pilot in charge is certified uh, as well. So interesting. The second category is called the specific category. I know there's a little bit of increased risk with these. Can you explain what the specific category is and how that works? Well, the specific category is, you could say, any type of operation that would go um, uh, further than the open category. That is to say, a drone of more than 25 kilos or flying higher than 120 meters, 400 feet. 
So trying beyond visual line of sight. So that's the uh, specific uh, category. Uh, the specific category works by uh, member state give an authorization to the operator, so the company who operates the drones, following a risk assessment that has been performed by this company. So the, the member state authority will check the risk assessment and the risk assessment contain, I would say, elements relative to the ground risk and elements relative to the air risk. And when this is done, uh, there is a definition of uh, when the risk is established. There are a number of mitigations which are implemented and the mitigations are, of course, part of the authorization and the operators has to comply with the mitigation that could cover training, that could cover the, 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 the drone and their, their equipment, etc. So it's a, it's, a, it's a complement which I think uh, allows to develop a more ambitious operation than uh, those in the open category and compared to the US system would av avoid to give waivers. So it would be authorization, normal authorization, not, not waivers. Uh, that makes an abundant amount of sense. And the transport of goods or drone deliveries falls under the specific category. Is that right, Eve? Um, the answer is, to be honest, yes and no. Uh, it's yes if the risk assessment conclude that it can remain the specific category. So, for example, you, you are not overflying too dense population uh, areas. But would you wish, would you be? Um, overflying densely populated area with drones that have a certain size, we, we say three meters, then you would fall into the certified category. So again, it's a, it's a matter of risk evaluation. That, you know, that's a great point. So let's, we're, we're going to digress for a second before we get to the certified category, which is the third. We had open, specific, and then certified. But you mentioned this air and ground risk. And in fact, uh, gosh, it's all blurring for me. I believe it was last week we had Glenn Lynch on. He's the CEO of Volatis Aerospace talking about Canadian drone regulations. And I believe like you for the air and ground risk, they use the Jaris Sora to measure that. Uh, is, is that correct? Is that what you use also in Europe? This is correct. We have introduced the SORA, for Specific Operation Risk Assessment, developed by JARUS, as an acceptable means of compliance to the requirements for the risk, the risk assessment. The requirements are in the, are in the rules. And this, we have a rather comprehensive means of compliance. So it's like a USAC, in fact, advisory circular, quite a comp comprehensive one which I think is, a, is a probably close to 100 pages, in which we describe how to practically conduct the conduct risk assessment in accordance to the SOAR. Uh, yes, I've looked at that, and you're absolutely right. It is a long document, and there's a lot of math in there and formulas, uh, but it's very informative to people, right, to designers, to operators, to know what the expectations are. So. Great, great use of that to basically have, as you said, a means of compliance. We also have a means of compliance here in the United States that we're working through for some of these more complex operations. Uh, so more to follow there, but let's talk about that third category, the certified category. You mentioned if you're doing drone deliveries, but maybe you're a very, it's a very large aircraft, you're flying very high or very long distances, it's gonna fall under this this third category called certified. Can you explain what that is a little bit? The certified category, we, you could say we are back into the normal aviation safety regime. That is to say, the drone must be certified in accordance to our equivalent to, to FAR 21. Uh, the pilots must have a license and the operator must have an uh, what we call an air operator certificate, which is a, an equivalent to say part 130, 135. Um, what do fall into this category? Well, we have identified, you could say upfront, a couple of uh, a couple of things which automatically falls into it. It's as soon as you transport people, that's one. The second, second category is 
when you you fly with a, a, a drone of more than three meter span above uh, either highly dense, uh, densely populated or a, a big gathering of people that's, uh, that's another one and the last one that we've identified up front is when it carries dangerous goods which in case of crash could create uh, a high a high risk for the population on, on the ground for example contaminated contaminated material uh, uh, could be could be an example and of course that's okay that's three examples we have said for those you are certified whatever uh, whatever you say but when you do the risk assessment uh, the conclusion of a risk assessment you start in a specific category you do your risk assessment and the conclusion could be well Finally, this operation is a such of a high risk that it should be certified. So it's another way to enter the, the, the certified category through a risk assessment where the risk is so high or where it could be easier, in fact, to, to, to certify uh, pilots, operators, and, and drones than trying to define a complex set of, uh, of mitigating measures. So that's the certified category. Okay, so just to recap, because uh, there's been a couple of different things we talked about just as point of contrast. Beyond visual line of sight, what we call in the United States almost like searching for the holy grail, we're doing that by exception and by waiver. Uh, you're saying that could potentially fall within the specific or the certified category, again, depending on that air and ground risk and the complexity of that operation. This is uh, correct. Operations over people. Uh, mentioned that that's, that's a newer rule, final rule here in the United States. Can, they, can you do that for 55 pounds and below in that open category without additional permission? Or is there some other requirements for operations over people? We, we, can, we can do, in fact, in the open category that we have subdivided in subcategories. Uh, in one of the subcategories, which is, in fact, uh, operation with drone of less than nine, 900 grams or less than, we say, uh, it could be to two pounds, give or take. Uh, there you can overfly people, but I would say occasionally. So you cannot overfly gathering of people, but if you have to, to fly the occasional pedestrian operation, that you can do in the subcategory A1, which is you can fly above above people. We we can also fly close to people. That's a subcategory A2, drones of less than four kilos, so yeah, give or take eight pounds. Um, this, uh, if you have in particular a, a slow speed mode, you can fly as close as five meters from people. So we, we had already in our rule, the possibility to operate uh, either above two people with those drones of less than 900 grams or very close to people with those drones of four, four kilos with a slow, uh, slow speed mode. If you don't have a slow speed mode, you, you must remain at 30 meters from, uh, from, from the people. So that's, that was in the original, original proposal adopted in 2019. And then, you know, if, if you're doing something maybe more risky than that, now you're in the specific or certified categories for operations over people. So in a way, our rule somewhat tracks what, what you've already been doing. What about for night operations? In our case, uh, the, the new rule basically says, hey, as long as you take some online training uh, and you have the right lighting, uh, you should be good to go to do night operations. How about how about in Europe? How do night operations work? We we had we had right from the beginning a lot for night operation. That was there, there was some debate. Some member states were were not supporting the idea, but fi but finally uh, it was agreed that uh, night operation could be considered into the uh, even open category, of course specific and uh, and certified. So they. Night operation was not perhaps the, the most contentious issue. Most contentious was what fall into the, the specific category and how do you, how do you assess, assess the risk, the boundary between open and specific. 
Yeah, that makes an, a lot of sense. I mean, if in open, you don't need any special approvals, of course, many people are going to want to put as many things uh, in that bucket as possible. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about remote identification. Uh, you know, that rule came out simultaneously in the United States in early January 2021 with the ops over people and night ops rules. Um, a little bit complex, uh, lots of pieces and parts from a policy standpoint and even technology standpoint that still need to fall into place. What remote ID rule did Europe adopt and how is that going? Well, we, we, we did adopt, in fact, the remote ID that we did adopt was essentially meant for security consideration. It was meant so that, for example, if you uh, operate a jail, if you see a drone that is coming close to your jail, if it's not identified, you can be, you can be suspicious. That was, that was the reason. So it's a, it's a system that we, we put in place. So it's not the network identification that was also, it was also discussed, but it, we, we focused on the, on, the direct, uh, on the direct remote identification. And this has been installed in, uh, in several classes of drones. That's what I was mentioning at the beginning. The drones that are approved following the, the, product, uh, the product legislation. So we, we have a number of classes of drones that are uh, obliged to carry remote uh, identification, but again, for a, a main purpose of security. I'm sure that we will move later on to identification in order to, to operate in the, in the UTM, uh, into the UTM system. Well, that's, that's a great transition to UTM. And just to kind of foot stomp this, because I think there's been some conflation or let's say combination of this idea of remote ID and UTM in the United States. And it sounds like in, in Europe, you've bifurcated these issues and the network identification solution is the relevant solution for unmanned traffic management or UTM. I know you all put forward the U-Space regulation that just recently went live. I know it's not, uh, I believe, gonna be implemented until 2023 lots of uh, research and development trials going on. Uh, we, we can talk more about that. But can you give us the real quick high level overview of what U-Space is? Because it sounds physical, right? It sounds like it's like literally carving out pieces of the air uh, where unmanned traffic management will occur. Can you explain better what it really means, U-Space? Okay, so U-Space is our, is our name for UTM in, uh, in Europe. For the anecdote, I think it was invented by the commissioner uh, responsible for transport, transport in, uh, in Europe. So it's a, it's a name that, was, uh, that had to be adopted, if I may say so. Uh, what it does, as you say, it, uh, it will apply in 2023. That's, uh, that's correct. Uh, it, is, uh, it will mandate, for example, that uh, U-Space service providers and providers of common information service are certificated. It will apply in a geographical area identified by, by the member states. Uh, it introduced a concept of common information services, which is the, you could say, all the information you, you need to operate uh, uh, in U space or UTM, be it provided by the state or for by the air navigation service providers, so the people that provide ATM services. And the services which are in there will be network information service, geo awareness service, US flight authorization service, flight information service, weather information service, and conformance information services. And as I said, the providers of those services will need to receive a certificate. So what we have is a rather high level regulation with this contain, of course, definition of the services I was mentioning, the high level criteria that the services must comply with. And ESA is now working hard on means of compliance in order to, I would say, to, 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 to help implementing that rule. And the intention is to have a notice of proposed amendment or equivalent to NPRM uh, to uh, by the end of this year. 
Yeah, so of those services that you're talking about, it's almost like what we talked about here in the United States of the the UAS service suppliers and you know what what services would be available. There's four that are mandatory and the last two are optional, the weather and conformance information. Uh, the four mandatory, my understanding was the network information, geo awareness, flight authorization, and flight information. They're all going to be mandatory. And this is probably a great transition also then to talk a little bit about what, you're, what Europe is doing in the research space, because here the FAA has uh, what they used to call the IPP program. It's now the BEYOND program, where quite frankly, a, a major focus, there, there definitely is U UTM and there's the UPP, which is a little bit different and focused on UTM with NASA. Um, we're focused on BEYOND Visual Line of Sight and be in the BEYOND program, primarily other things too. But CESAR, uh, S-E-S-A-R, uh, a group ha has been doing a lot of UTM trials. And my understanding is there's gonna be some amazing trials across seven or more countries this fall. Uh, can you tell us a, a little bit about that? This is, uh, this is correct. CESAR is an, uh, an entity uh, put in place by the, by, the Euro by the European Union, like, uh, like us, in fact, uh, Cesar uh, has quite a, a significant budget, and they they have, in fact, already financed fifteen projects. Sorry, they have, in that, uh, they have financed twenty-two projects, which are which are closed, and where you can find the results in the Cesar Cesar website. And fifteen are active at the time being, and. Uh, Projects include indeed large scale demonstrations in various countries, uh, not only with drones, but also with urban, uh, with urban air mobility. So there is a significant effort uh, conducted by, by César uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of research. So they're mostly related to use space, but uh, of course they, they have a, a, an interest for, for other activities like uh, advanced air mobility. I, I know this, uh, Eve, because I worked with Thomas Neubauer. He, he uh, just wrote a recent definition on, I believe, network connectivity uh, functions. Uh, that was part of GUTMA and uh, uh, GMSA uh, put, put that definition out. Very important definition on how all of these things need to be connected to each other for this to work. And his product, Airborne RF, is pretty incredible. For everybody out there, if you haven't read my piece, it's in Drone Life. And uh, so I talked about U-Space and how this is all working. And, and there's hot links to uh, CESAR and some of, I think it's Golf GOF 2.0 are there gonna be the trials that are gonna happen in the fall. And I cannot wait to see that. It's really exciting what you guys are doing, including in advanced air mobility, not just for small drones, I mean, they're going to be flying, uh, you know, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles uh, in some countries, and that's pretty cool. Let's switch gears completely and talk about a topic that's very important to every country because we're seeing more and more, whether it's careless, clueless, or criminal individuals. Uh, you know, you mentioned remote ID. It's, it's focused on security, which I completely agree with. Uh, let's talk about counter UAS. And uh, that is something in the United States that only a very small handful of federal agencies, primarily law enforcement or military, have the ability to actually effectuate counter UAS. In other words, employ counter UAS systems. Uh, you know, you might be able to detect them somehow, but actually to do something about it, that's the challenge. What how are you in Europe dealing with counter UAS? What's, you know, what's the status of counter UAS there? Well, there is, uh, in Europe, you, you may remember that was a couple of years ago, we had this uh, incident in uh, Gatwick Airport just before Christmas, where a lot, I mean, I think the airport was closed for, for two days, or, uh, creating a complete, uh, complete uh, havoc uh, everybody and millions but, of dollars, I believe, during that time and, were lost and, because of that. 
extremely expensive too, but uh, perhaps the human aspect was more visible. All those families that wanted to go on holiday that were, were stuck in Gatwick Airport. So be, following that, uh, ESA decided that we, we should try and develop a uh, counter US action plan. Uh, some elements are published on our website, not all, but this element is uh, in fact uh, in various, various elements. One part is to educate the public on, uh, to, to avoid that uh, some events do, do happen. Uh, also to prepare aerodromes to, to be able to, to, mitigate, to mitigate the risk. Uh, support, I uh, would say, the risk assessment of uh, how is the risk that an airport would be affected by, by unwanted drone operation. Uh, ensure that CUS measures are implemented from a global safety perspective. So we have to, to be careful, for example, on counter US that you are not jamming GPS and therefore jamming all aircraft around you. It's probably not something you want to do. Well, and and also, yeah. Eve, I, just to interrupt you there, I mean, you mentioned GPS. It's something I research and write about a lot for Inside GNSS Magazine. And this, uh, you know, GPS runs everything, right? So if you're messing with GPS, you're messing with society and life in general. So more than just airports, absolutely big deal. So I didn't mean to interrupt, but please continue on counter UAS. It, it's correct. It was, I must say, I was horrified at, uh, at, the, at the meeting when someone from a, a military organization told me, oh yes, but we will jam GPS and say, please. <laughs> but, <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> and the other yeah. point is occurrence, occurrence reporting, so to report incidents so that we could learn about the incidents. So this is our action plan, which is reasonably on time as far as I understand. And um, we have published recently, so they, they are available, I would say, on our, on our website, guidelines for the management of drone incidents at airport. And that was done in cooperation with, uh, with airport, uh, airport organization, uh, airports, and uh, of course, our, our member states. So yes, it's something no, on which we have, been, we have been doing quite a lot. Yeah, uh, counter UAS is something that, that's a global issue and we're, we're just seeing it everywhere. Uh, to your point about reporting, you know, for those that are out there, I hope drone operators know that Part 107 does require mishap reportings. And the FAA has an amazing uh, portion of their website that talks about UAS sightings where pilots and the general public can report to the FAA, you know, any kind of dangerous drone activity that they're observing and they do track that. And sadly, if I recall correctly, I feel like we're up to like a thousand such reports every month. And that's really frightening when you think about it. Uh, check out the FAA website yourself. And, and I think we'll end uh, here on this note, so speaking of websites. Uh, Eve has mentioned that the EASA website is, has a ton of information. So if you wanna find the regulations he's mentioning, if you want to learn about U-Space or this counter UAS action plan, I highly recommend that you go to the EASA website in addition to the drone incident uh, information that he just mentioned as well. So, well, we're, we're running short on time. Um, let, let me just ask you this one last question then, Eve, and, and thank you so much. This was really helpful to understand what is happening in Europe and, and you embedded things in your regulation right up front, like ops over people and night ops that, that for us required a waiver until recently. And even now we're still working through some of that. Um, you're, you're out there on the front lines of uh, unmanned traffic management, and, including advanced air mobility. Uh, you've got a counter US action plan in place that's a, that's a federalized plan, as opposed to us. Uh, I think it's mostly a, a joint DOD uh, plan right now remains a work in progress. Uh, so any, any last comments that you'd wanna tell the group uh, about what they should know or where they should look to find more information on European drone regulations? Well, the ESA website has a dedicated page on civil UAS, which I would recommend to, to look at because you can find all the regulation, in particular something called uh, something where you find the regulation and the 
acceptable means of compliance put together, so which is a very helpful document. You can find also our activities, ESA activities on research, like the one we, we want to, we are conducting on a drone collision with, uh, with aircraft, the, con the consequences of a, of a collision of a drone with an aircraft. You can find also all our events uh, and uh, the, uh, I would say, recording or presentation that were made there and videos for, you could say, um, uh, safety awareness. So uh, very simple video requiring the, the bare bones of what is the open category and what are, what are the limitations. So this is certainly a good website to go. The other website I would recommend to go is to the CESAR website, as you mentioned, Don, because there you can find all the projects that are being uh, worked on, all the closed projects and the deliverables. So it's, a, it's again an extremely rich website, but full of... Uh, full of, uh, of good of good information so if I, if I may i would recommend those two plus the one of uh, of uh, euro control which is a uh, which is a an international organization mostly in uh, in europe but uh, wide europe which also works on drone and that uh, do also a bit of research on drone and where you can have uh, guidelines on the uh, common altitude reference uh, uh, drone uh, uh, drone air traffic rules. So there is there is quite a lot of things on those three websites: ESA, Eurocontrol, and CESAR. That's that's a perfect way to end this. So thank you so much. I mean, I really worked with Enerdrone to create this podcast to give people actionable information that they could go and educate themselves and and learn more. So you've given us some terrific information and resources. So thank you again, Eves. Um, we're going to call this a wrap, but before we do, I've got three minutes left, so I just want to mention to everybody, number one, thank Eve for also being on our clubhouse. Uh, I, I have a Drone Law Connections clubhouse, and, and Eve was our featured guest last week. It's every Thursday, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. If you're on clubhouse, follow me, join that, and uh, this week, as a preview to next week's Drones at Dawn podcast, which will be same time, same place here, again, Thursday, we're gonna hear about African drone regulations. Uh, you've probably read in the news, so many amazing things happening there, especially with zip line and medical drone deliveries uh, out in Africa. And we're gonna dive deep with Kim James next Monday uh, to talk about uh, African drone regulations and what she's seeing there. Uh, and this Thursday before that, We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as a preview on our, uh, on our Drone Law Connections Clubhouse. Uh, also, as we close out here, just want to say, um, if you haven't joined my Patreon page, I'm going to ask you why, uh, because not only did I put, do I put these up, you'll see some bonus podcast footage with Eve and all of my guest speakers who don't talk about drone regulations or use cases. They give you life wisdom, which is completely priceless. And uh, just great stuff coming out there. I also have my blog there. So uh, check out my Patreon page. I, I hope you would consider joining that. And uh, that's it again. Thank you so much, Eve. Thank you everybody out there for joining us again. Uh, join us next week for African, African drone regulations. And if you have the time, join in the clubhouse on Thursday on that same topic. So that's it. It's a wrap out here. Have a great week. <laughs>